where news comes first. This is ABC7 Extra. It's August 21st, 2017, and this is ABC7 Extra. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Josie Ortegon. For the next half hour, we're talking about the EPISD, a bond proposal, nearly $669 million proposed. The proposal was approved this week by the Board of Trustees. Many said the bond is greatly needed, and the time is now, adding that the district has been kicking the can down the road for far too long now. The bond includes renovations, closing and consolidating schools, improving athletic facilities, technology, security and transportation but it's the biggest in El Paso history and if approved it could be adding more than $200 in property taxes for the average homeowner. You can email us your comments and your questions now to abc7extra at kvia.com. You can also reach us at 915-496-1771. On Twitter, you can use the hashtag abc7extra. EPISD's Board of Trustees unanimously approved the largest bond in El Paso history. That $669 million bond proposal will be on the ballot this November, and it's up to you, the taxpayer, on whether or not it passes. Several in attendance began clapping after the vote came down, but it doesn't stop here. The taxpayer gets the final say this November. Since we are less than three months away from voting on this bond, several taxpayers spoke during an open forum before the vote, sharing concerns they had for this massive bond. One acknowledging that the school district needs the funds, but this isn't the right way to go about it. Another questioning the timing and recommending the district opt for a smaller amount. Others strongly supporting the bond, which could increase your taxes. I'm in favor of it because I've been a firm believer of the children are our future and they're going to be taking care of us. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they have all the tools that they can so that they can take really good care of us. This bond is $200 million bigger than the one that was rejected for YISD back in May. If you remember, YISD was forced to go back to the drawing board after their $451 million bond did not pass. The district then came back after cutting $20 million off the original amount, which then passed in the November elections. Followed this, the, the same one that they did on the, their successful campaign. Uh, and you have to listen to your community. You know, this wasn't a bond proposal that we put together. This was a bond proposal that the community is asking us for, and I think that make, will make the difference. The board had a week to look at the proposal before approving it. During a news conference Wednesday, Trustee Dory Fennenbach said there were about 80 people that prepared the proposal, and it would have been very difficult to add or take away from it. If the bond fails, what's next? Will they come back to the drawing board with a smaller bond? Trustees wouldn't really say whether or not the district has a backup plan, saying this amount is what's needed. The bond is an important investment for our community right now. Um, the the uh, Citizens Committee worked off of uh, the Jacobs Engineering Report and two other nationally recognized uh, engineering firms that identified $1.2 billion worth of needed projects today. Uh, they were able to create a bond of approximately half that size and these are investments that we need to make today. And the district has less than three months to convince voters to vote yes to the nearly $669 million bond, and they're wasting no time in doing that. EPIZ is taking its message straight to the people, meeting them face-to-face -face and answering questions during a community meeting at the West Side Regional Command Center. This was the first meeting following the trustees' decision to take the bond to the voters. ABC 7 Stephanie Guadian has a story. Will the money go to what is be what it's program for. Ross Moore came to the community meeting determined to ask EPISD officials that question and others. He's the president of the El Paso American Federation of Teachers. He was pleased with the answer. They will build a direct linkage so that if you vote for the bond, you're getting actually what you voted for and not a uh, bait and switch game at a later date. This is what district officials hope to do over the next few months, answer questions they want voters to know. We're in an era of declining enrollment. We have half empty school buildings and we need to invest in modern learning environments and that there, this is part of a consolidation process which will help us operate more efficiently and put more resources into the classroom. But Moore says he and his federation of teachers are not ready to back the $668 million bond just yet. He wants to make sure facilities that would be closed are used for public purposes and not handed over to a charter chain which is basically going to take even more kids out of EPISD and thus 
increase their financial issues and decrease the quality of education in the district. EPISD Superintendent Juan Cabrera was at the community meeting and is preparing for a very busy three months ahead. We plan to, to hit as many as we can, all any community meeting that we can get in front of in the district. So I would expect three to five days a week we'll be out there talking to folks all across the school district. EPISD has a good case. They now need to make it. Stephanie Guadian, ABC7. All right, and part of that plan also includes consolidating schools. We'll take a quick look at those schools right now. Bradley would be consolidating Fanning Elementary School. Henderson K-8 through would consolidate Clardy Elementary School. Lincoln K-8 through would consolidate Bond and Roberts Elementary Schools. MacArthur would consolidate Bonham Elementary School. Moorhead K-8 through would consolidate Johnson Elementary School. Terrace Hills K-8 through would consolidate Collins Elementary School. Dowell Elementary School would consolidate Schuster and Crosby Elementary Schools. And Moorhead K-8 through would would consolidate Johnson Elementary Schools. Now, this would save uh, the district nearly $9 million. And during this week, let me introduce my guests really quick. Tonight, we didn't have, hadn't had a chance to introduce them, but uh, Board President Dory Fennenbach and Superintendent Juan Cabrera both joined me tonight. Uh, both, thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday night. Now, the district is really going into uncharted territory. This is a huge bond, but there's a great need for it. Yes. Uh, we had, as we had mentioned in your in your in your brief, there um, three years ago, the we the board of managers hired the Jacobs Engineering, a nationally recognized engineering firm, to do a facility study. It was the first facility study that had been done in the district in 15 years. We assessed the 92 campuses, and uh, they identified 1.2 billion in in critical facility needs that need to be addressed today. Um, because we don't have the resources to address 1.2 billion, we uh, the, the trustees decided to put this in front of an 80-person citizens facility committee, and uh, that committee had the option of selecting projects to determine the size of the bond and which projects would be prioritized this first round. They brought the 668 million to the trustees, and uh, at that point, uh, that was what the community had expressed mattered most. It was uh, technology. Uh, athletics, fine arts, safety and security, transportation, and then just the um, the many needs uh, just for facilities across the district to create modern learning environments. That's what they that that's what they asked for, and that's what the, the trustees delivered unanimously. And that's about 86 percent facilities. My understanding. I think we actually have a pie chart showing that. But 86 percent of the bond proposal includes facilities, and and we just saw a, a brief list of the schools that would be consolidated. Tell me a little bit about why there's a great need and what, what condition these facilities are because my understanding you all took a tour of the schools beforehand uh, when the committee was meeting to determine which projects would be approved or not. You know there are I don't know people who don't have children in the schools uh, you know our, our, our schools are just very uh, aged the average age uh, is over 50 years they've had deferred maintenance for years and years uh, many of them have uh, swamp coolers and not HVAC, and the swamp coolers aren't even functioning well. Uh, you know, ceilings that fall in, uh, these are just unsafe, unfit environments for our children. And other facilities that sit half empty because of declining enrollment. This is an opportunity not only to renovate and revitalize schools, but consolidate and operate more efficiently by operating fewer, better schools where our children can be placed. And I think during this week, uh, following a news conference after, after the vote, I remember you saying that this, this, the amount of students that you're losing every year is equal to the size of a small high school. Right. Right. A thousand students a year for about five years is the projection. We actually lost 1,400 this year, which is the size of some of our high schools. Um, so this, this is a trend that we're planning for, we're for forecasting. Um, and so we can right-size the district, but we have facilities that will remain where our children need to be placed, that need to be modernized and create modern learning environments and fit safe conditions for those kids. What was the planning process involved to determine that these schools will be consolidated or closed? So the Board of Managers, uh, when they were about three years ago, they uh, used the Jacobs Engineering to, to do a facility study across the district and identified the $1.2 in facility needs. They uh, put together a Citizens Facility Committee at the time. I, I co-chaired that committee when I was not involved as a trustee. So I became very familiar with the facility needs. I toured facilities, became very familiar. Um, this was about two years ago. 
and uh, made recommendation to the Board of Managers, and the Board of Managers created a f facilities modernization plan in April 2015. In May of 2015, these seven tr new trustees, uh, f three of us were elected, the seven were seated, and we, we passed our second balanced budget. We went out for a tax ratification election where we were able to access $14 million in additional state funds every year without a, a local tax increase. We created the District of Innovation, first district in the state of Texas to create a District of Innovation, and, uh, and then worked on our st strategic plan uh, with, with the superintendent and his team. In January, we came back around to the facility study. Uh, we put together uh, a new 80-person uh, citizens facility uh, uh, advisory group. That committee worked over four months. Uh, they toured schools. They reviewed the data. We had the Jacobs Engineering uh, study and also had those numbers verified by uh, two architects. So we knew the numbers were good and still valid. And uh, they were presented with a number of projects and the 1.2 billion in facility needs, it was their task to prioritize which of those projects would make it into a bond proposal that they could present to the, to the Board of Trustees. And that's where we got to the 668. At that point, we, there, it was very difficult for us to just, to, it, we, it, it's a large bond. Mm -hmm. We're very sensitive to the tax impact. But these are needs that exist in our district. And there was no safe way for us to try to dismantle what an 80-person citizens committee was recommending to us. So the trustees got behind unanimously uh, the citizens committee recommendation. I think a big question on a lot of people's minds is, is $669 million. You all had a week to review it and cut or add if, if needed. Um, and do you all decided not to. But what if this bond doesn't pass? Is there a plan B? Well, the, the needs of the facilities or the needs across the districts are still going to, going to exist. There's no plan B. You know, we are, we are working towards plan A. Uh, we've, we've approached this with the, the safest, most equitable uh, process that we can think of. The fact is that the state of Texas does not fund for facilities. We must rely on local property taxes. Uh, El Paso has not uh, increased our local, local property tax rate in over nine years. Uh, we, we must address the needs of our children and the needs of our facilities. So that's what we're working towards. Tell me a little bit about uh, the projects that, that weren't uh, approved in this bond. Uh, I know that we've, we've heard a lot of concern from people in, in different parts of town that say we need money too. Well actually with this bond every school, every school gets something. Every school will be touched. And when I asked, you know, the, the, the trustees uh, participated in, in many of the, the meetings as observers only as observers, uh, and so we sort of watched the process unfold. Um, and, and after they made their decision, uh, I, I had spoken with some of the, some of the committee members, and they, I said, how did you come up with the 31 projects? They said, you know, they, they really wanted to emphasize and prioritize technology, safety and security, um, and uh, buses, some of the transportation issues, uh, the buses that we need to replace, and high schools. So um, seven of the ten high schools will be rebuilt or partially rebuilt. Those are high ticket items. Uh, that's where most of our, our students are concentrated and we were able to do that across the district. These were just the most important needs of the district and that's how they, they were selected. And I know you mentioned during the news conference uh, that it would take about six to eight months for projects to get started, another three to five years to get projects done. Uh, tell me a little bit about the phasing process. Have you all figured out a timeline for these projects and whether how soon they would be built? The consolidating of the schools, uh, parents out here watching wanting to know when their child's school will be shut down. Yeah, so as soon as the bond was approved last Tuesday, our Deputy of Finance and Operations, Ms. Candelaria, got her team together, started working on that, and beginning to prioritize projects. When they, we had to wait until Tuesday to see exactly what was gonna be on the table. And uh, we're putting that together now as we speak. It does take, if the bond passes in November, you've got to then drop all your plans, you've got to release your procurement documents, and that's why it takes about six months just to get the process started and get somebody approved. We would expect earliest possible, you know, May, June 17, we'd start construction and phase that in so that uh, the, the initial consolidations wouldn't happen until sometime in 2018. So we've got plenty of time to work with communities is, is there, that are going to be impacted, whether that's because, you know, school will be closed and we have to work with the, with the vacant land and vacant buildings. We, we're very excited about being able to sit with the communities and talk to them about what's the, the best use for any, you know, there's 16 buildings that are going to be 
consolidated into seven. So there's nine parcels of land and nine buildings that we'll deal with. So we'll spend time with those communities. It's going to happen over the three to five year period. There'll be plenty of notice for everyone. And uh, we're, we're, we're pretty confident that process will go well. And an, and an important thing to note is that the schools wouldn't be closed down at the same time. It would, it would be periodically during the three to five years, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Tell me a little bit about uh, the facilities. I'm getting a lot of questions actually from viewers uh, wanting to know uh, the decision to decide how much money went into each school. So, so again, we had a Jacobs Engineering Study and we had two different architects verify the numbers that were needed in the facilities. They analyzed everything from you know, light bulbs to uh, HVAC to uh, creating modern learning environments. And they, they just told us what, our, what we need to bring our facilities up to, to create modern learning environments. Mm -hmm. That's what all the basis of the data was, was from that. I, I'm getting a question from a, a viewer on Twitter, Aaron Ritter, saying, why does this bond include non-classroom related items, for example, the athletic turf? Well, we've, we've got to, just like uh, any other uh, asset, you know, our, our athletic turf is something, the decision was made about 10 years ago to replace that, so they only have about an eight-year useful life for athletic turf and for the safety of our young, young boys on the football field and then boys and girls on soccer. We've got to make sure we replace that every eight years. Okay. Another but, but, they, but just to be clear, mm -hmm. if you have an asset that's not a facility, has a, a shorter useful life, you know, five to eight years, for mm -hmm. example, with, with technology, three years, then we, we only finance that debt uh, so that it's equal to the useful life of the asset. Now, another question from viewers is following through on broken promises or on promises that are involved in this proposal. Uh, someone tweeting me saying, uh, closing a school that was expanded in the last bond and the district has shifted money to stadiums. I'm not, could they, any more specifics, which school is that? Uh, not uh, really stadium, but how do you all plan to follow through on, on promises involved in this proposal? Well, well, one thing about the 2007 bond, uh, they were planning for new growth in the Northeast and yeah. the, the population of, of Fort Bliss shifted where we thought it was going to come into EPISD district. It actually shifted further to the east yeah. outside of the EPISD district. So therefore, there was no longer a need for a Northeast high school. So that growth so, didn't materialize. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was a bond oversight committee that needed to, at that point, reassess and reallocate those funds. So, so there was a very thoughtful process based on changing information and that was happening in, as, as the population evolved or didn't evolve. Uh, re regarding the stadium, there, were, um, there was some disagreement at certain high schools about how they wanted those funds spent. We were letting that, that community, this was Jefferson, letting mm -hmm. that community decide how to spend those funds. It took some time for, for that process to be completed, but we were trying to respect the, the needs and wishes of the community. Okay, we have to take a quick commercial break, but right after we will take more of your tweets and your calls. Remember, you can call our newsroom at 915-496-1771. You can email us your questions at abc7extra at kva.com, or you can tweet me at Joe Sirthagon on Twitter. Or you can also use the hashtag abc7extra, EPISD bond. So we're talking about tonight. Get your calls in, get your tweets in, and we'll get those answered for you. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. I'm joining, I'm Josie Ortegon. Joining us tonight is Board President Dory Fennenbach and Superintendent Juan Cabrera for the El Paso Independent School District. And a reminder, we are live. You can join this discussion by calling 915-496-1771. You can email us your questions at abc7extra at kva.com or tweet me at Josie Ortegon. This segment, we're talking about the numbers. Now, let's take a look. If the voters approve the proposal, the property tax rate would increase to 18.8 .8 cents to $1.42 per 
100 property valuation. That translates to a 212-month or 12-month increase in school taxes. Homeowners with a $138,000 home would pay $213 annually. And just for perspective, uh, the large this is the largest one. This is larger than the city of El Paso's $473 million quality of life initiative that was approved in 2012. And also, again, bigger, something that we've mentioned during this week, the YSD bond that was approved and then or failed and then approved last year. So let's talk about the numbers during a news conference uh, last or last week. I know you mentioned uh, you were asked why the board didn't make any cuts during that week that you all had to review it. And we'll play a little bit of your response now. Many people in the community don't understand that we have declining enrollment. We're losing about a thousand ch children a year. That's the size of a small high school. So people don't understand that we have schools and facilities that sit half empty. People need to understand that um, by each school consolidation, we can realize almost a million dollars in operational efficiencies, and that's money that can be reinvested in the classroom where they benefit our kids. I know you mentioned um, you were you were all were sensitive about the impact on the community. Uh, voters are facing a lot in taxes, and they're paying a lot. They want to know that this money, if approved, would go to projects that will materialize. Tell me a little bit about the process and why you all decided to put the $669 million bond on the table. Yeah, so the, um, you know, we had the Citizens Committee, committee help us prioritize you know, $1.2 billion worth of critical facility needs that we knew we couldn't address. Uh, we are extremely tax sensitive. We, kn we know there are a lot of demands on our community right now with the, with the city and utilities and others. And, and uh, so we wanted to, to find a way to create an opportunity that was palatable to our community, yet still met the needs and addressed the needs of our, our children and our district. So the Citizens Facility Committee created this package, created the 30, 31 projects, and the $668 million was decided by, then, by them. Uh, it was very difficult at that point for us to figure out how seven trustees could pick out of those 31 projects, which projects would come off of that, how, how we could then decide which of those were more important to us and which weren't. So because you know, we, we didn't feel like... Reallocated those monies and that was what we used to begin the work at Urban or, or to set aside money for Urban and they're in the planning phase now. And then part of that money was used for the Franklin Stadium, for the Jefferson Stadium. Andrus uh, received a, a $12 million fine arts facility and we did a, a few multi-purpose buildings across the district. So we spread those 54 million out uh, pretty well, equally, but the majority of the money stayed in the Northeast. But there's a concern that, that these are, there may be some broken promises here. How, how are you in guaranteeing to, to taxpayers that you will follow through on what's proposed? So, th so these are identified needs that need to be addressed. We have a five-year plan, so this is going to be a, a very strict and um, succinct timeline. Uh, and we're going to have a, a bond oversight committee. We'll have a, a program manager to, to make sure that the projects happen exactly as promised. Okay. All right. And we will be back right after this break. Uh, remember, you can call us, 915-496-1771. Tweet us or email us your questions. We'll be right back. No, what? What? Out of town, I'll keep it. Yeah, we do. 65%. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So I'm told we have five minutes once we get back. We have five minutes. So if there's anything that you all want to sort of emphasize, I, I was going to talk about a little bit of uh, the, the rejected projects that were included on the list. Um, but you mentioned that earlier, why projects were selected. Yeah. Um, I think we've cut that, covered that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we talk about, you know, um, who will be affected yeah. by property tax, what, what the, t the tax impact will be, and mm -hmm. who will be affected. Okay. And that will give us an opportunity to say, if you're over 65, yes, the taxes the are frozen. Okay.
65, which is good. Welcome back. You're watching ABC 7 Extra. I'm Josie Ortega. And tonight we're talking about the EPISD bond. Joining me tonight is Board President Dory Fennenbach and Superintendent Juan Cabrera. And tell me a little bit about, again, the tax impact. We mentioned that during the last break, but, but there's, there's some exceptions here. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so again, very sensitive to the tax impact. Um, it, so there's a, the tax exemption has actually increased by 25000 And uh, if you're 65 or older, your taxes are frozen. So it's very important if you are over 65 to understand that this you will have uh, no tax impact, no tax increase. You will be able to help fund, support this bond without uh, paying any additional uh, taxes. Okay. Uh, also disabled mm -hmm. veterans. Disabled veterans also have a tax freeze. It's important that those two that communities understand that, that the, their tax will not be affected. Okay. I'm getting a, a question from a viewer on Twitter. What commitment can EPISD district and trustees give our children to avoid deferred maintenance issues going forward? Well, obviously with, with the new buildings, that's going to be something that will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, deferred maintenance, uh, I think the biggest challenge with that is that you know we've let our, our buildings go way past their useful life. So any organization that's asset heavy like we are, that facilities are, are a big part of our work, we just, we just need to create the organization which we have that can keep up with the maintenance and then you extend the life of assets and you make sure that, that while they're in use that they're safe and secure and I think we, we, we've done that already, we put together a team to do that but we're playing catch up now. This has been years of neglect that we're trying to, to remedy here in the next few years. So it's important that we, uh, that we get this right. Okay, uh, another question. Why not delay the bond to properly inform taxpayers instead of rushing to the ballot? We feel that you know, two and a half months is, is enough time to inform the, the community. Uh, we spent four months developing this, allowing the citizens to develop this. So we've been very, very thoughtful and methodical about it. Again, this process began three years ago with the Jacobs Engineering Study that the Board of Managers initiated. How much longer are we willing to, to defer these needs for kids who are just getting older year after year? You know, these are the kids we're sending to school tomorrow, um, and, and every year we, we delay is, is a year lost for, for our children. I think it's, these are very difficult decisions to make. Uh, politically and otherwise, we have a board of seven trustees that have the political will and the courage to do this. And I think as long as we are, work hard enough to make sure our community is informed, we'll, uh, we'll get the support. How do you plan on convincing taxpayers to vote for it? Uh, you know, I think there's so much progress happening in El Paso right now. You know, with, with the progress downtown, um, with uh, the, the jobs that are coming to the community, we have to uh, we have to focus on education. I think everyone understands the importance of education in our community. Um, EPISD is the legacy district here. We're the largest district of only almost 60,000 children. Yet we're the second lowest. We have the second lowest property tax rate. But we have to compete with it, with the surrounding districts on teachers' compensation, and we have to compete on modern uh, facilities, modern uh, learning environments. And when when people uh, come to look at El Paso, will they be attracted to our city if we can't provide that? We can't establish that we are providing excellent education. That that this is a community that invests and prioritizes education. And by supporting this bond, that is a big signal to the people who live here and the people who want or can, are contemplating living here that we prioritize education. It matters to our community. I think a lot of uh, of at least people that I've, I've spoken with, viewers, um, wanting to know how EPISD can move past a lot of the distrust that they've experienced over the past couple of years, and that may affect them when they go uh, to vote this November. I, I am just implore our community to, to look at the track record of the Board of Trustees and the track record of Superintendent Juan Cabrera and, and really understand what's happening in our district. We have uh, early college high school, we have project-based learning in new tech in both uh, uh, Franklin and in Irvin. We're creating equitable, equitable, strong schools across the district. We have uh, expanded dual language, which we will have in every school across the district by uh, 2020. 
there are really wonderful things happening in our district. And across the state, they are looking at EPISD as a lighthouse district. We led out on District of Innovation. We're leading out on dual language. We are getting uh, interest in major funders from around the country who are uh, very inspired by what they see uh, by Superintendent Juan Cabrera and his team. We are building a district. Superintendent Juan Cabrera is building a dist district that we all can be proud of. Uh, and uh, it, we just we need to get be a part of this momentum and, and push it forward, continue it. And what can uh, parents, students, the community expect in the coming months as you, as you try to get this approved? I think it's just about getting as much information about the needs and, and what the, the bond will do for the district and how important it is. As President Fennebach mentioned, you know, this is really about keeping the progress that we started. You know, I've been here three years now this month, so it hasn't really been that long, but we have made tremendous strides in, in trying to build trust. We expected from the beginning that this was a five-year process just to rebuild trust and for people to feel like, you know, we kept showing up every day doing what we said we were going to do, and, and so it takes time. And I think we're, we're on our way, but we're certainly not there yet. We, we don't think that we're there yet. We're focused on continuing to build trust, continuing to keep our word. This is just a big part of it. I mean, you, you have to give credit to the trustees, to the managers. Before 2013, when I arrived, nobody spoke about decline enrollment. Nobody spoke about the deferred maintenance and how, you know, the condition of our buildings. Mm -hmm. But we've been transparent from the beginning. You know, we've had budget issues. We solved all the budgets, past balance budgets, but all of that occurred, you know, a long time before I arrived. Those seeds were, were planted, but there just wasn't transparency and trust. And we've, there's nothing that we hide it. Everything going on in the district, we, we put out there right away. You see it all the time. We do our own audits and we put it out there. If we have money problems, we put it out there. Facilities, decline enrollment, everything's on the table now. We, we really are trying to make this a district that it belongs to the community and we're just facilitating the growth and, and the continued direction forward uh, for the district. Okay, well that's all the time that we have for now. Thank you both so much for joining us and thank you all for watching. This has been ABC 7 Extra. Have a great night.